Well, all right. Hail. Hello. Welcome, everyone, every person, everything, everybody, to another Random Heathen Ramblings podcast here on the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast uh, presented by Midgard Musings, myself. Uh, my name is Jesse. Thank you so much for listening, tuning in today. Um, appreciate all of your support. Hope you've had a great week. You know, hope you've had a great uh, solid week since we've talked last. Um, you know, we're in the middle stages of the month of September. And I've uh, got a nice, really awesome guest. I say a nice and awesome guest uh, for us here on the podcast today. You guys may have heard of him. You may even be following him on his various uh, social medias. I'm not sure to what um, extent he uh, he dabbles in the social media platforms aside from Facebook and um, a blog uh, blog site, um, which is a I want to say it's a WordPress site, but anywho. We are going to be getting into um, today's guest here in just a moment. But before we get into that, before we welcome our guest today, let me just get some of the house cleaning, housekeeping um, stuff taken care of. So if you're not yet following the podcast, if, you're, if you just stumbled across this podcast because of a recommendation of a friend, um, thank you so much for listening. But this is the Midgard Musings uh, podcast. This is the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, I should say, presented by Midgard Musings. So if you're listening on a podcast, you know, streaming platform, Spotify, Anchor, Google, Apple, um, Breaker, uh, I don't know, whatever the podcast uh, preference of choice, uh, consider, please, uh, doing a couple things. First of all, favorite the podcast, upvote it, whatever your podcast streaming platform allows you to do. Uh, consider doing that because it helps um, distribute these podcasts out to relevant audiences. And if you are so fortunate as to be part of the YouTube premiere um, for uh, the public, uh, congratulations, hail and welcome. Um, and if you want to uh, see these video versions of the podcasts, um, later on after the premieres then consider becoming a youtube channel member because every thursday morning 9 a.m eastern i think that's 6 a.m pacific basically the start of your thursday mornings you know um you can uh tune in and watch the premieres on youtube and then after that you need to become a channel member so check the show notes down in the description um all of that kind of fun stuff that's your ticket to um, be a part of these podcast um, excursions, adventures, as it were. If you ever want to voice your thoughts or share your thoughts and talk about things on this podcast or any other uh, podcast episodes, you know, this episode or any others, uh, you can always call into the Midgard Musings hotline, and that number is 615-671-9832. It is a Google Voice number, right? So standard rates apply, I guess, for the Google Voice thing. But um, yeah, let's go ahead and break through um, into today's episode. We've got a special guest coming up. I will cordially introduce you to him here in just a moment. So here we go on the Ram Heathen Ramblings podcast. Booyah! Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So um, here we are today. Um, it is uh, at the time of this recording, it is a, uh, a Monday night, but you guys listening and watching. Looking at my calendar. Uh, Mid-September. Big time mid-September. So 
Um, you know, we're going to welcome in our guest today here shortly. Um, like I said, you may know him from uh, his social media presence on the Al Sadu Saxon Heathenry Facebook group. You may also recognize him from Germanic Heathenry on Facebook. Um, and I want to say that there is a Germanic Heathenry blog post. Yeah. Dot com. We're going to be talking with uh, Robert Sass today um, from that uh, platform. So I want you all to uh, give a big warm welcome, big huge applause, uh, drop your comments down in the live chat, or if you're listening, you know, outside of the uh, YouTube platform, uh, give a huge hail and welcome to Robert Sass of uh, the Al Sadu saxon heathenry so that's an interesting thing that we're going to be talking about today guys is um you know we're, we're going to be leaning heavily on the historical side of heathenry um specifically saxon heathenry and uh one of the things that uh we're going to be talking about today is a recent post about uh satir i'm going to I'm probably miss miss uh pronouncing but once we get robert on here to to help me with the you know pronunciations of it, satire, Loki, and misinformation about Saxon heathenry. So let's uh, welcome in Robert Sass and talk about it. Here we go. And all right, everybody, like I mentioned in the intro, we are joined today on the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast with my special guest. This is uh, Robert Sass, am I saying the, net, the the surname correctly? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Well, you know, if you're from uh, Chicago or Kansas, it certainly is Sass. But if you're from Germany, it would be Herr Sass. So, Sass. Uh, okay. But but you know, uh, like as a musician, I go by Bob Sass. But as a heathen and a, a corporate accountant, I go by Robert Sass. So, okay. You know. <laughs> the surname thing is a funny thing. Uh, uh, can I call you Bob? Is that for the sake of? Yeah, just... sure. All right. So Bob, the, the 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 surname thing is always funny to me because I have an interesting surname, um, and and you do, and I and I and 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 in the uh, interest of just poking a little bit of fun here, just for the sake of fun, like sass, right? You got some sass, a little sassy, little you know, a little bit of attitude, and I'm a st I'm I'm still wagging, and it's like a wagon sitting still. Do you ever get? Do you ever get that? With your surname, do you ever get that kind of? You like, know, I, I've gotten it since probably preschool. Bob's ass, sassafras, sasshole, kiss oh man. my ass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've had it, man. I've had it so many different ways. You know, the, the still wagon. You know, the wagon sitting still, still dragging, uh, 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 wagon steel. Just like, just you know, and it's Dutch, I think, in in its origins. Um, we, you know, my my, the Germanic side of my family that that immigrated. Uh, over here it was it's been you know it actually was at one point spelled exactly the way you would uh look at it like a wagon sitting still and every time i talk to people I'm like hey, what's your last name i always tell them it's still wagon you can spell it however you want it's like a wagon sitting still you know <laughs> <laughs> but um well you said still dragon and i and i get it but i wasn't sure if you meant like dragon with fire and wings or dragon like you're dragging something along you know both road both <laughs> yeah both you know just like like you're like you're dragon you know like it's you know like a like a, a, a what do you call it uh, like a trolling motor you know like you just slowly just dragon ass you know kind of thing or dragon like a, a fire breathing beast of myth um <laughs> I, I, I've heard it all. I've, I've heard it all. And I'm sure you've heard all kinds of variations as well, like you just said. But um, welcome to the podcast, first of all, sir. And thank, and you. thank you for being here. Yeah. So for everybody that that may not know who, uh, you know, uh, Bob Sass, Robert Sass is, you know, um, I mentioned earlier in the intro, um, you've got some 
social media presence. I, I follow you um, and your work on the uh, Germanic Heathenry Facebook page, as well as in the um, Altsadu Saxon Heathenry Facebook group, which is a very focused and very um, specific approach on heathenry, right? So for, for, my, for my listeners and for the viewers that are, are maybe like, oh, well, heathenry is just heathenry. Like they think Germanic heathenry is like an umbrella term. And I've even mentioned in some of my videos or some of my podcasts where like, you know, my content is focused on where I'll say it's, you know, Norse paganism, Germanic heathenry, and what is often um, kind of like lumped into in modern times as also true. Now, I want to give you the opportunity here um, you know, since it's focused on Saxon heathenry, like when we talk about Saxon heathenry, like what are we specifically talking about? What's the focus? Well, I do want to say first, it's kind of like maybe I'm giving a disclaimer. We do welcome all Germanic heathens in the al Sadu group. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the page um, is called Germanic heathenry with the al Sadu logo, but that's the page. Um, but really, you know, the narrow focus for us Saxon heathens is, you know, some of my mom's family still live in Germany. Mm. And when it's not pandemic, I go visit them. All of my dad's family, um, but my dad, my brother, myself, and then our children, the rest of them live in Germany because uh, only my grandpa came here. Um, so, you know, I've always had roots there. Um, and I'm not saying I'm not proud to be American. I, I love being where I'm at and I'm proud of being where I'm at, but because I've had uh, an international family, so to speak, um, you know, I've always felt that I had a link over there, um, mm -hmm. but I was born and raised here. I don't have a German accent. I speak German. Okay. I read far better. Once I make a mistake with my family, they revert to English pretty quickly because, you know, <laughs> over here we don't study foreign language until high school and my grandparents spoke it in the home but um once they passed away i stopped using it so i can still read fluently because it comes back but speaking unless you use it often you can really lose it so yeah you know but the focus of the page is for those you know there some saxons did go to england but saxony is actually in northern germany and yeah you know so and that the people in Northern Germany still call themselves Sassom, which is the old Saxon word that means Saxons. And, and they did for a long time. Um, so, you know, a lot of people don't know that because the English Saxons get a lot of good press. And, and honestly, yeah. you know, one of the negative things about, you know, like when I go to Germany and visit family, there are some Third Reich, I call it anti-memorials it reminds them of a negative past. And because sadly that, you know, Nazis taking heathen stuff shouldn't ruin heathenry, but, you know, it's not good press. So yeah. my family in Germany is very well aware of that. And Germans are aware of that history. And a lot of them are very, like the 2000 year anniversary in 2009 of Arminius, you know, the barbarians on Netflix, you know, mm -hmm, Arminius mm -hmm. defeated. Yes. The Germans kept that really quiet. They didn't want to appear that they still were more militaristic. So they really played it down in Germany, which is kind of sad um, because Hitler and Arminius are two different people. Arminius actually never tried to expand German territory. He just tried to keep the Romans out. And after the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, um, he didn't attack Rome. He, he stayed. Um, so you know him and wasn't and wasn't daughter. wasn't Armenia say uh, uh, of German descent and didn't he get adopted into the the Roman um, lifestyle or am I misunderstanding? No, you're that? absolutely right. So the history is is you know the Roman way was they would take children of the nobles mm -hmm. and then they would raise those children. So he was taken as a kid and when he was brought back, he said, "I love my people." You know, a lot of scholars say he was torn between two sides, but that's BS, because if you decide to kill 22,000 Roman troops, you're on one side, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's unarguable, right? Like, <laughs> there's no fence to sit on there. Like, you, you pretty much made your stand. Yeah, so, say. and the Cherusker were one of the tribes, you know, the Saxons 
didn't just appear out of nowhere. You know, a lot of people think that they they started as a small sliver on the Jutland and they conquered all of Northern Germany and they conquered all of England. Um, you know, I wish I could say my ancestors had the military prowess of Rome, but reality is those tribes, you know, Arminius was poisoned by his own people for trying to be a Kaiser, mm -hmm. trying to be a Caesar. Um, those tribes who became the Saxons in Northern Germany, they didn't have Kaisers or Kings. You know, the word Kuni is a, a family leader. It comes from the word Kun or Kin, which mm -hmm. means family. And um, it became, you know, like in Christianity, a king is a dictator appointed by God, you know, of divine right, so to speak. And uh, yeah, there was there was uh, the royalty, uh, the, the nobility was had a, had a direct correlation to um, the sacred, the gods, as it were. Exactly. But it was family based and the, the, the leaders of the families were equals. You know, and, and that is shown well in the Netflix series, actually. You know, that's one of the more accurate shows on television. So. I loved I loved Barbarians. I would I would actually encourage anybody that has Netflix, hopefully it's still out there, but Barbarians, um I I was thoroughly impressed with so much of the, the pop culture, the, the the media influence that um uh Norse and and so, I mean, we may get into this here in just a little bit, but like Norse and Germanic, we're, we're talking differently from like mainland Germania versus the, the Scandinavian countries. But as far as like the lost king or the last kingdom and Vikings and stuff like the, 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 the Netflix series Barbarians to me was like such a uh, refreshing approach to historically accurate representations without bleeding, like without like sacrificing too much while still being entertaining. Would you agree? Yeah, I really do. I mean, there are, if you want a documentary, there is a really good documentary out there. Um, but, you know, for a, a drama show, that's about as good as you can get. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about, because like I said before, like when I talk about some of the content on my platforms, you know, Norse paganism, Germanic heathenry, would you say that there's a difference between the two culturally? Because I think that there are like the 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 names and some of the the like there there's similarities, but we're not we're we're talking about almost like the same things, but in a different way, I guess. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but like the Scandinavian countries, like you know, Iceland and non-mainland uh Germanic countries. Um it, so it's like when we're talking about like Saxon heathenry, Saxony, the mainland Germanic areas, um, there's like there's there's bleed over. Is, is that an accurate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there's two things you have to talk uh, land and time. So mm -hmm. the Saxons, they were attacked first by the Franks. They were neighbors to the Danes who were also heathen. So the Danes wanted the Saxons to win because it's better to have a heathen buffer between you and a militant army trying to forcefully convert other countries. You know, first they converted the Frisians by force and the Danes are very content with the Saxons being in between them and the Christian Franks. Um, and they started building the, the Danverka, the Danish wall during the time of the Saxon war. So, to answer your question, the Saxons and the Danes were allies. Even the most famous heathen Saxon leader married into the Danish king's family. So he would have been actually related through marriage to the historical Ragnar, um, if we do believe the sources, which, you know, are the sources a little legend or are they literal history? There is some yeah. debate there. But if a, lot we of, take a lot of debate. Yeah, I mean, so the Saxons and Danes, since they were neighbors, they did share the same culture. But let's talk about this to make it simple. The, the, to answer your question, the Germanic, the Scandinavians are also Germanic people. Sure. So Manuther for the word moon versus Manuth for the word moon in Old Saxon. There's not that much of a difference. Um, but the Danes and the Swedes, they're geographically closer to each other, right? And they mm -hmm. have nine year sacrifices and cult centers. You know, there's a cult center in Uppsala, Sweden. There's a cult center in Lera and Tisu, mm -hmm. Denmark. Um, but yet the Norwegians and the Icelanders, they do more private family bloats. 
So there are some regional differences for sure, but for the most part, they're all celebrating the same holy days and the same moons at the same time, celebrating for the most part, the same deities, whether you call them Donner or Donar or Dunar oh. or Thor. Yeah. You know, um, linguistically it speaking, it's, it's, it's just the linguistic differences of the region speaking towards the same uh, sacred being that, they, they, they all kind of collectively at, at least overall had a, had a veneration observance uh, towards, right? Yeah, and how different is, you know, there's the Thor's Oak of the Chatty, the tribe just south of Saxony. Um, mm -hmm. There's the Ermansul and Hohen Seaburg, uh, Thor's Well. Um, and Ermansul you did and it. Ermansul and Yggdrasil are probably the same. It's just, you know, um, slight language variants. So, you know, sacred trees, putting the blood on the trees is common to all the Germanic Scandinavians. But you actually, I think, did a, a recent uh, blog on altadu.com, which for anybody listening, watching, like, you know, altadu.com is, is a, it, it's your blog post site, right? So we're going to link that in the show notes and in the description for anybody that's, you know, questioning, like, oh, what are you talking about, right? Well, do your due diligence and uh, check it all out um, because it's there. Um, but yeah, you recently, I think, did a, did something on the Ehrman Soul, um, which again, I, I follow you on, on the Facebook platform because that's where I see most of your posts come out. And yeah, the similarities between that and Yggdrasil which has always been an interesting thing to me, um, this, this world tree and, and the, the uh, linguistic connotations between, you know, um, the dead and uh, being hanged and, and the, the connotations between Odin or Wotan or Woden, depending, like I said, on the, the linguistic um, observances or, or, or understandings of the, of the word of the deity. Like there, there, there's some of that, there, there's, there's correlation between this 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 sacred uh, cosmic center um, that the Germanic people of various regions understood, or at least viewed the world as in their perception of things, right? Yeah, I mean, they lived. I mean, what the barbarian shows very well in any documentary the difference between the Romans and the Germani or the barbarians is that. They lived in forests and bogs and swamps. I mean, the trees, um, they were used to, uh, you know, that type of overgrowth. Whereas the Romans, the, there weren't many trees left in Italy. The Romans cut them mainly down. Sure, they used mm. a lot of stone, but they also used a lot of wood. Um, you know, there was a difference between Roman Gaul or modern France, which was civilized. You know, the Celts had roads and you know, it, it was a different type of society, not super different, but it was still different from Germanic society. And, you know, the Romans understood Celtic society and they weren't afraid of it. Um, but, you know, a Roman army, that's one of the reasons why Arminius won, you know. The Romans were invincible on an open plain, but you yeah. get that army in a forest. Every advantage that the Roman army has is gone. Yeah, it's like fighting um, so on your trees, home turf. Yeah, and you know, the trees, they do give us life. I don't think our ancestors understood oxygen like we do with modern science, but you know, the, the trees do support the world um, by emitting oxygen. And, you know, the trees are, you know, it, it, is, it was the center of their world. And if you see the Northern lights, they can look like tree branches up in the sky. So, you know, a lot so of people will say that science just deep bunking our myths but you know um that's how they saw their universe that was their worldview it's a very interesting thing to think about the, the the science and the worldview and how it how like we like because because of the advances of modern science and how we can understand and perceive things nowadays breaking it down in, in, in simplistic forms um that are perhaps our ancient ancestors view things like you look at things like uh mushrooms and um, the fungi, you know, uh, these are are living things that connect. Like I've I've heard, I've heard tale of, of of stories of how mushrooms that that connect to trees that 
neighboring trees or neighboring living uh, uh, flora and fauna that are suffering through the, the fungal system will um, sort of transfer life and, and transfer energy and transfer um, healing and, and things to the, to, the, to the other living beings within their proximity to like, oh, I'm doing good over here. Let me help this neighboring thing over there through that interconnected root system. And it's like, when you, when you look at how, like, I think in, in some, uh, and, and this may be going into the weeds a little bit, but when you like, when you look at like the berserkers or, or some of these, um, uh, like figures of sagas that, that, that used, um, psychedelics and things like that to to achieve a heightened state of awareness it's like those were certain things that they use we know of things like henbane and and other certain natural resources that they were able to like tap into this like primal rage or primal reactionary uh behavior and it's like there's there's some perhaps right uh something to, 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 to consider with how the, the, the nature of things uses those uh, resources to nurture and expand uh, for, for each other and, and how these Germanic tribes use them to achieve certain heightened states of awareness and, and, and heightened states of accomplishments. I don't know what you think about that, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a reach perhaps, but it's, it's perhaps. Well, not really. I mean, I'm going back to world war II history a lot, which is way past heathen history, but why did the German soldiers, when they conquered France in two weeks, they, they didn't sleep for three days because they were using meta amphetamines. Um, Mm. And the, the, the French were not, they, they were expecting the attack by the Maginot line and they had no idea what Blitzkrieg really was. Mm. So the Germanic peoples from way back, um, you know, the berserkers is a, is a good example. You know, a lot of people say it means bare skin and other people say it comes from a bear. I, I lean towards that view, but um, you know, cause it's kind of stupid to run in battle without armor, like in the TV show Vikings. I mean, they can they have helmets off for the TV shows so that you can know who's who probably. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, in reality, you'd be a moron to go in the battle without a shield. And Especially the way battle was was conducted back then. I mean, it was it was all hand to hand, with the exception of maybe you know artillery through archery and and things like that. But I mean, why wouldn't you protect your most vital areas, like your head and your and your torso? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> to answer your question, though, yeah, I think. I mean, that- I might be the craziest idiot out there to to want to fight somebody, but also, uh, I I would hope to have at least a, a a bear, the bear necessities, right? Baloo, the Jungle Book, the Law of the Jungle, right? the bear necessities, right? I want to protect the most vile. Like, if I lose my head, I'm done. That's it. Like, <laughs> yeah, and you know, I've seen documentaries um, where they put together some warriors like. Um, they can tell from a warrior grave if someone got hit with an axe in the face but yet survived and then were killed in a later battle. I mean, yeah. they had some pretty horrific scarring in that world. Um, yeah. You know, um, but I do believe, to get back to your original question, I, I mean, I don't think that every Germanic soldier was on some form of substance, um, but there were certainly... Uh, at least we have attestations of it and you know I guess um, since since we're bringing this up I will say you know one of the myths so to speak of Vikings is that they were looking for war but really if you're sacking a monastery it's hit and run your yeah. goal is to get out of the ship to get the gold and the silver out of the monastery and get back on the boat before the army comes because the warning bells are going off There's no time to rape nuns. And I'm not saying that Vikings never raped nuns, for example, but, you know, the Christian testimony makes them seem like that they were bloodthirsty. But reality is, is that the Christians had sacked a lot of heathen holy sites like the Donar Oak that St. Boniface, Mm -hmm. um, the Ermansul, the Franks boasted that they stole gold and silver from the heathen Saxons at the holy site. 
I think the Danish neighbors saw what the Christian army was doing um, and they copied it. I, I really believe that. And there are scholars that believe that too. A lot of people told me that I'm crazy, but seriously, you have in 783, the Danes are sending emissaries to Charlemagne and they're asking him what the heck he's doing. Well, because they've wreaked havoc and taken all this Saxon heathen gold. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean. I mean, from a militaristic standpoint, right? Aside from our beliefs and everything, you look at Charlemagne and, right, like, I mean, <laughs> military genius? Yes and or... no, he lost some battles. He wasn't invincible like an Alexander the Great who won almost every single battle. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, ruthless, just completely ruthless. I mean, I did a podcast a week ago talking about, and I, and I, and I don't have the source uh, readily available, but I, I did a podcast a week or two ago about, um, I think it was Harold the Ruthless, and it was, there was a saga talking about how this, this, this guy decided like, oh, I need to, I need to conquer, uh, it was a city, I think it was maybe Sicily or, or something like that, but he like, he lit birds on fire because of the, patterns that the avian like there the, the avian patterns of, of flying from forest to city forest to city he like studied him he's like i'm gonna light these suckers on fire and then when they fly into the city they're gonna literally just raise this city to the ground because they're all gonna be on fire because that's their natural pattern on things so you talk about harold the ruthless i think was his name and at least in the saga it's like hey when you talk about war and we talk about conquering it's like all bets are off. It's the gloves are off and you're just, you're trying to conquer. That's, that's literally what this is about. It's, it's conquering lands. And so some of these stories and some of these sagas that we have uh, from a historical standpoint, you know, paints a picture of heathens as being these, let's just like ruthless savages and, and these ruthless, like just, you know, uh, just, you know, like you said, you know, killing raping or whatever but like tactically speaking like when you when you invade you're not a you're not really positioned to think about the pleasure of it it's like there's there's a tactical approach to it like i need to get something and and get out before the army comes to yeah react. there's a difference between a raid because the great heathen army was something that wasn't really seen before and i'm not saying that the vikings never you know, when I say Vikings, maybe that's not the best term to use, but, you know, I'm not saying yeah, Norsemen for the sake didn't of... attack Norsemen, but when they went to England with a great heathen army, they were there to settle. Whereas when they're sacking Aachen, which was sacked more than Paris, because that was actually Charlemagne's capital. Paris gets mm -hmm. the press today because that's the modern capital mm -hmm. and Ragnar Lothbrook, if you call him that, um, Pregnaris is what the sources call him. Um, you know, he he actually spent more time sacking Aachen, but uh, you know they were really, for the most part, trying to get treasure, and that's why later they were paid off often. And that mm -hmm. didn't discourage it; it had the opposite effect. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, if we raid, you're going to pay us off, and we we besiege you, and you're going to pay us to go away. This is a great idea. Yeah. Um, but for the it was all politics part, at the time, or a lot of it was. Yeah, and it, I do think there was a, a fear, though, of the Danes. That's why they built that Dane Verka, you know. And Charlemagne had the best cavalry the world had ever seen, and, and heathen shield walls would not stand up to a cavalry charge, to be really blunt. But the, the Franks, they did not have much of a navy. The, they were always outclassed at sea. And I think the Danes realized that early that they had the advantage in ship and their land battles, they, you know, how it's shown even in the last kingdom in particular, which, you know, some things are inaccurate, but that's right. They're going to attack on land when they feel they have the advantage. They're not going to attack otherwise, you know, invading with a huge army was not until the great heathen army was not something that they were really known for. Yeah. A lot of conquests, a lot of, lot of, uh, you know, and that's, you know, I think that's one of the biggest like problems. The Christians were the modern for the most part, though. People forget that, you know, Frisia and Saxony and the Chad, I, they were the Chatty. They, you know, all these Germanic tribes are getting conquered. 
you know, and if Charlemagne could have gone north and just attacked the Danes, he would have. I really believe mm -hmm. that. You know, he's an empire whore is what I call him. Guys like Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hitler, if he could conquer England, don't you think he would have eventually attacked the United States? I mean, certain people in history, their ambition is so big that, that they just keep going and, until they can't go anymore. And that was Charlemagne. Well, well, I think, you know, uh, when, when it comes to like warfare and conquest, like two, uh, this is a, this is a two part thing. I think a lot of so, so what I was going to originally say was like a lot of um, people coming into heathenry, like they, they look at um, this whole religious view or the spirituality, the religious view of it. I'll, I'll, I'll just use that term for right now as this like, you know, super masculine, hyper masculine, as it were, um, approach to things. And it's like. Okay, there was a lot of that going on at the time, but this is not the this is not the this was like a, a very specific um, uh, view or the, not even a view, but it was a very specific niche of this of of the people, right? Like not everybody were warriors, not everybody were raiders, not everybody were conquerors. There there was like certain points in time, and there were certain peoples that that were involved in this sort of thing, but it's not a it's not an overarching view of of heathenry, as it were. Like, yes, there was a lot of warfare and there was a lot of things that 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 that, that took place at a time, and there was a lot of you know warband cults that that existed, but it didn't it didn't exemplify the overall society or the overall group. No, you know and I, I mean? would say it got more masculine with time. What I mean is, is you know, and this is gonna piss some people off, but we do have different words in the south like ragnarok is scandinavia only mudspellus and muspeli um these are the continent the the northern germanic tribes who are neighboring the scandinavians so what i'm trying to say is when those tribes were conquered first in the south what we know as germania today so to speak you know ragnarok is certainly and the hall of the fallen it's not something that you see in continental sources. It's de it's definitely a later, I hate to say, a, it, it evolved, I guess. No, it did evolve. We talk about Valhol, right? Versus Folkwander. And yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. Like that's not that's not continental Germanic. No, so we yeah. have in continental, it's heaven wanga. Yeah, which you would say vanger. Um, so Folkwander and heaven wanga. So. Folkvanger would be the Scandinavian, and um, our modern word heaven is actually a heathen word. Um, yeah. The full word is heaven wanga, which means like a paradise meadow. Um, I would I would actually encourage people that are not necessarily like continental Germanic heathens, or or, and, and I don't know if this is accurate, uh, Bob, but continental Germanic heathens and Saxon heathens. Would you you Would you say that the two terms are similar or the same continental germanic and, and saxon because well, like you've got the hayland right and 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 for like a lot of uh uh scandinavians there are scandinavian heathens they're they're going to look at like the uh the uh um the the uh damn it the uh words of the high one the the the, the uh damn it it's, well, the, while you're it's like it, the, it's me, like the uh, Norse proverbs, right? Like so, like oh, like people like to think they they, they like to try to at least in, in in some ways they like to try to uh, connect a sacred source or or a sacred book. The the uh... go ahead because I'm I'm, I'm blank. Well, let me right say now. something shocking, but it's true. Everyone, when they think about it, they're going to realize that what I'm saying is true. Germany is 82 million people today. But the northern part of Germany that was the old Saxon area, that is 25 million pe people today. And yeah. that is more people than Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark combined. And that is the case back in heathen times. There were more people on the continent venerating Thor and Odin than there were in Scandinavia. Yeah. And that so shocks people, but it's absolutely the truth. Now, it of course, Central Europe and the Celtic areas, Gaul, they weren't worshiping Germanic gods there. They had different gods. But still, Northern Europe, which neighbors Scandinavia, 
had a much bigger population and, and they worship the same gods as the Scandinavians. Yeah. So the words that I was looking for, and this is this is mind boggling to me that I actually blanked on this at the moment, was the equivalent of the Havamal to the Highland, which is there's not really an equivalent to the two things, the, the Saxon Highland or the uh, and, and if I'm using the terms incorrectly, but like well, in terms Highland of like is a gospel, the Highland is a gospel. Right. And so I would urge people that are not continental heathens that are not continental Germanic heathens, Saxon heathens to at least read the Hylian and understand like the terminologies because there there's mentions in the Hylian of Christ, you know what I mean? And then so many of these like things that, that come later on after the Viking age or during the Viking age, am I right? Like those, well, those let me put it this way. There are more attestations of, um, though I, I'm using the Scandinavian word, but the the Nornir, which in Saxon heathenry are called shapers, there's yep. more attestations in this gospel of the shapers than there are the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is, is this was a gospel written to convert the Saxons and they turned Christ into um, half Odin, which is where Tolkien got Christ it. Christ was almost like a war chieftain in the Halion. Yeah, like right? Gandalf is <laughs> yeah. Tolkien's half Christ, half Odin. Yeah. Um, it kind of, you know, because it was English missionaries that came up with this idea. So they... Like Christ's you know, disciples in the Halion were like his, you know... They were his thanes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. So Christ was a Droton, a yes. warrior chief, and they were his yes. thanes. So he was yes. pre presented as a Germanic warrior. And, you know, by studying the difference between the biblical gospels and the hellion because there's no bias in the hellion and a lot of people get pissed when i say this and it is a gospel but you take how they they change the gospel from the biblical gospel and that gives you clues to what heathenry was well you so, can you can say that that people hate on it, but like for for instance me and I, I don't know what roots or what background you come from bob but like i was raised christian i've read the four gospels times and times and times again i've read actually the entire first of all i've read the entire king james version of the bible eight times back to back to front <laughs> so when i look at the halion and i'm like hold on what wait a second looking at my background my culture and everything like that and it's like this is interesting like there's 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 the caveats uh, it, like just it blows my mind the influence that occurred at the same like timeline speaking you know what i mean yeah i want to say though there is i mean there is the hellion but there's also law codes that people forget about like when the franks conquered they forced laws on the frisians and they, they forced laws on the saxons so the saxon laws was the lex saxonum and there was a a, a lex free so something like that free sonum mm -hmm. and the things that they outlawed showed exactly what heathenry was they outlawed um burning the dead in pyres yeah for example. they yeah. outlawed going into the sacred groves and and venerating ancestors and ancestral gods in sacred groves so i mean Which i can give more examples crazy. But... that is crazy to me because if you look at like judaic law and you look at how the israelites and the jews of old like would would um conduct ritual and things like that and i'm like this is it there's a mirroring aspect to the levitical priesthood and how there was um designated people to communicate to the sacred just as the germanic people had designated um people to communicate to the sacred like i said like there, there there's a there's a correlation there's a, there's a comparison um and i just go wow like well that's true but there's one difference um you know in in bible jehovah creates mankind in his image whereas whether you study the continental germanic where um twistu gives birth gives birth to manus who then has three sons uh ermin yeah. este um and ingve 
it's the same in Scandinavia. This one God has one God has three. So yeah. that would be, uh, uh, you know, there's. Um, but you even Odin look at that. Brothers. It, yeah, Odin, uh, Billy, and Vey. Exactly. And then there's yeah. Bor and Buri. Um, Which so even these, before that. These names are not linguistically tied between the continent and Scandinavia, but the patterns are exactly the same. They are. They are exactly the same. And that's what that's what like kind of blew my mind initially, like looking at it. It's like you, you even look at some of the Judaic texts. It's like when when God says, you know, in, in, in the Bible, the, the you know, Judaic is we create man in our image. There's there's a plural um, term used. So who is our right? Who what, what are we talking about when we're talking about us, our it's not just we're going to create them in my, we're going to create them in our, you know, that whole sort of thing. And it, it just opens up this whole, other, like, if, you, if you're going to be narrow minded to look at like God in the Judaic God as, as being a, a polytheistic being, I think that there's some challenge that can be brought up to you in that perception of things because there is no one god there is there's this one individual being that exists in a plural sense there, there there's multiple aspects and that may get into some other metaphysical aspects of the worldview of of the deities and in the worldview of of the self even if, if you want to look at like the soul complex and all these kinds of crazy, wonderful, wild things that our Germanic ancestors adopted in, in understanding what makes us, us. Even right? the word soul is a Germanic word. Yeah. In yeah. Hebrew, it's ruach. It's a different word, but siole becomes soul. Yeah. It's that's, that's our ancestral word, but I, I don't think I really shared. I did share that you know, the, the monotheistic God creates man in his image or their image, but monus is your Germanic word for mankind. So right. the idea that humans descend from the gods, which sounds crazy to a lot of people today, but that's why the deities at times are called ancestral deities. And you have genealogies of um, clan leaders tracing descent back to the gods directly. Yeah, and the we see that. Yeah, we see that in like, uh, I think it's Saxo Grammaticus um, in the Dane law um, sagas and things like that, where like Odin is a, a king um, and, and some well, of that sort of stuff, Tacitus right? Too, or Tacitus. Um, because, yeah, Tacitus know, he's the even. He's yeah. used that, that yeah. term, Manus, and he's the descendant of um, mankind. Even Arminius, we mentioned him before, his name yeah. in German would be Hurry for army, Man. Mm -hmm. So man, Man of the army. Mm -hmm. um so you know um the, but that word ma man is kind of like uh, adam would be your hebrew equivalent adam means human or man which is funny not funny haha -ha, but funny as in like and i don't even want to use the term ironic but funny as in like interesting because my dearest and nearest friend a brother of mine his name is adam adam uh he's my gothi and uh he is uh <laughs> he he's phenomenal and it, it this is an interesting segue when we talk about like linguistics and, and and the names of gods one of the main points that i thought we would like and this is really kind of cool how it just like again segues into discussion of things uh, a recent uh blog post that you did um bob on your all to do um website was the uh the uh saturday and by the time this podcast comes out, we're going to be like getting into the weekend. So like this is coming out for, for the folks listening and watching like this is, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be Thursday. Um, but like Saturday and, and it's, it's going to be annotated in the, in the show notes and, and in the description. Um, it's uh, th th there, there's some linguistics connections to. Um, the whole Sater, Loki, misinformation about Saxon heathenry. I was wondering, uh, Bob, if you could like, what was the inspiration behind this specific blog post and, and why now? Like, what was the catalyst behind talking about this specific thing? Because I've, I've seen some, some, in, uh, some, some uh, posts from people over time 
talking about Saturday and, and this this I don't know connection between Loki and, and, and Saturday and Loki's day and you know I might yeah. answer that question a little too long but there's a point like let me use Judaism in as, as an example they have a sacred calendar and the secular calendar of the world um and what's interesting is their spiritual calendar kind of dictates to the world the whole world does a seven-day week now which is certainly not Germanic in origin by the way nor Scandinavian in origin but there still is a difference between the 12 Roman solar months and the lunar moons of the biblical calendar. And the same thing is true with Germanic heathens. You know, um, our Germanic ancestors looked at all the signs in the sky. They didn't just look at the sun. They looked mm -hmm. at the sun and the moon. And timekeeping to me is very important because I do believe had heathenry survived until today, the timekeeping would not have changed. Even if Rome was a dominant culture in the world, and it still kind of is, um, because Roman Catholicism is the culture that made the Christian West of Europe and America. Yeah, the Gregorian calendar, the whole thing. Yeah, and the Protestants, they're Catholics, they're just Reformed Catholics. Right. Um, you know, so um, the Germanic tribes had the word moon. So if I, I used in my blog, I said, in Germanic languages, you add a TH, it means there's a sequence. So there's a number seven, and then you add a TH, that's seven. So seven by itself means there's seven whatever, butterflies. Um, or seventh is a sequence of seven things. So you take the word moon and you add a TH to it, it becomes the word month. So today, because we're Romanized, we're Catholicized, we're Protestantized, um, we don't understand that a month used to be tied with the moon and we don't pay attention to the moon. The moon can tell us when an early winter is coming or a late winter or when an early or late spring is coming because the sun and the moon, you know, in a sense work together. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't how to scientifically say that, but, you know, our ancestors saw these signs in the sky and you know, our ancestral calendar for Germanic and Scandinavian heathens was technically a lunar solar calendar. So the months were cycles of the moon, but they knew how to use the time of winter, which a lot of people today would say the solstice, to determine when they would add a 13th moon to their year. So heathen timekeeping is one of the reasons for it, because I believe that heathenry survived till today. We would have a spiritual calendar and then we have the calendar that we use to go to work in school like the non-heathen world that we live in right mm -hmm. um i really believe that's so that's one thing and i used to be very militant because i like to fight misinformation but it is a losing battle you'll never win but you know in in my past i was big on calendars but also i'm big on who are the gods you know does satyr come from saturn which I, it certainly does um you know, sure. I read old, I, I do have a master's degree in religion. We can discuss that maybe if we do this again, um, sure. but it, it's not in Germanic. Um, you know, I was raised learning the history of the Saxons, um, you know, and that's what, what, you know, because when I studied religion at the university level, that's where I lost my faith because the ground doesn't lie and biblical archaeology disproves the Bible. Um, but I use those skills that I learned there, here. And a lot of people say that's a weakness. I think it's a strength and a weakness um, because, you know, I, I was able to teach myself old Saxon, which, you know, very few people get at a university because I finished first in my class in graduate school. I was a number one Hebrew student and I studied um, overseas in Israel and I did dig. So I do have archaeology in my background too at the master's degree level, not PhD. So I can read archaeology reports and think, gosh, when I was doing digs as part of my master's degree, you know, the location was different, dry sand versus wet forest bog. <laughs> it's a big mm -hmm. difference, but I at least can understand the archaeological reports. So, you know, I have these things in my background. So I'm very, I understand that the, the ancient sources describe really what heathenry was. And then these later sources become quasi blind and blurry over time because the more centuries you get away from heathenry, the more misinformation, even there was misinformation even before the internet was invented, you know, because 
Christians, you know, they, they think witches and they start hanging people, having witch hunts, you know, and there's panic and fear. And that, that leads to gross exaggerations, like the Vikings took time to rape nuns. I mean, I'm sure it happened sometime, but it was far more rare than the Christian sources state because that fear, especially in monotheism, fear with religion, it, mm -hmm. it drives people crazy. And heathen, we shouldn't have fear in it. But I also think we need to be smart. So what, why do I write? I have two things. One, I know how crazy monotheism is. So George Carlin, if he were still alive, may he rest in peace, would say, I still, I've gotten some common sense, but since I still believe in a religion, maybe I don't use all my common sense. It's probably what George Carlin will say. But nonetheless, <laughs> and I don't mean to attack Wicca, or Scientology, but these two faiths don't have the best appearance to the general public. And neither does also true with all the racism and the Nazism and all this sort of stuff. So I believe that if we at least have some scholasticism out there, I mean, most Christians in church, they don't read their Bibles and they're totally ignorant, okay? Um, I do find sadly most people online that claim to be heathens are that way, but the few of us who are trying to be more authentic, are, are authentic, you know, I don't want to be the Tom Cruise to Scientology. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I want to be, you know, because even if I'm wrong, and I have updated my blogs over the years, every time I do more research, find that something else is wrong, I go out in public and I admit it. I say, guys, I used to teach this. It was incorrect. Here's my yeah. evidence. Here's why. A real leader can do that. A lot of the other also true orgs can't do that because once they've taught something for so long, it would piss people off that suddenly they changed their website and said, that's why a lot of people don't want to give up on you all being on the solstice. You know, they can't change because they've taught it one way for so long. Um, I started with the Wiccan Wheel of the Year too when I first came into heathenry and then I studied the sources. I'm like, holy cow, this, this Wiccan Wheel it has nothing to do with Germanic heathen timekeeping. So I'm giving a long-winded answer, but one, I, I, I want to show the world that we're not Tom Cruises, no offense to Tom Cruise, and we're <laughs> not a bunch of racists, and, and also we're not a bunch of crazies, because a lot of people think that people who run to religion, like if you, you know, there's this one video on YouTube that has millions of hits called Neo-Pagans are Stupid, and the reason why they get ripped on is because how they behave, and I, I'm not going to tell people how to behave, but for those of us that take the religion seriously, and it actually is a way of life, and we actually do do ritual, we don't say that we do, because a lot of people say they do ritual, but they don't, say they get together with other heathens, but they don't, um, they're not us per se, not that they can't join us and become serious if they want, and not that their way of thinking is necessarily wrong, but I, I want to show the world and I want to reach out to those who are serious that, hey, you can study, you can learn. Um, I want to grow and I want to understand and I don't want to just follow. Let me use this one other example. I was in Israel when the whole David Koresh thing in Waco went down. Um, the oh, oh, man. Oh, man. And the oh, Jews man. were laughing at the Americans because David or David is a messianic guy. You know, the Messiah is going to descend from David. And yeah. Koresh is the only Gentile in the entire Old Testament, which is the Jewish Bible. He's the only Gentile who's called Mashiach or Messiah or Christ, because Christ is Greek, Mashiach is Hebrew. Yeah. So, you know, everyone in Israel knew David Koresh. That wasn't his real name, and he was a nut job, it seemed, before the FBI did. Um, that's the power of education, you know what I mean? Like, if you know what the more historical path of our ancestors was, you're gonna be less likely to jump off a cliff like the Branch Davidians did and so many people died. You know, um, Christianity's let a lot of people off cliffs and I'm not saying I didn't jump off some in my life, but I've, I've learned to be cautious. No, I think, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, look, like we've all, were, I, I like to uh, consider myself a, learn, uh, a student, you know, and here's the thing. We present ourselves on various social media platforms, whether it be a blog or whether it be a YouTube channel or whether it be a Facebook page or whatever. And those who are looking to learn will quite often um, pull from these 
videos or from these posts and things like that and be like, hey, because so-and-so said it, it is thus, it is it. And the importance that I think we should all, like from whether it be a content creator of, of any sort, whether it be video content or written content, anything that we provide to the public, um, if we're wrong, if we're proven to be inaccurate in our statements that we come back and we um, redact those. And because like, again, we're, we're, we're in a position to, we've, we've put ourselves in a position, right? It's not that we've been asked to put ourselves in this position, but that we have put ourselves in this position to educate or teach. And I personally, right, am not a well-versed heathen. I've been heathen for probably like the last six years total of my life. Prior to that, um, I was raised Christian. And my, the, 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 the change uh, to my religious approach to life, the change to my spirituality and the change to my worldview has taken time. And time, as we perceive it, is what it is. And so if we, and as we, um, you know, publish things that people want to cite or people want to, and, and, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the interesting um, caveat that, that we find ourselves in, right? Because we, we like, oh, well, well, so-and-so said it, right? Rob Sass said it, or Midgard Musing said it, or whoever said it. Um, they, 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 they look at people like us as a reliable source. And so there's an obligation. There's, there's, there's a sense of obligation. And I think when we look at a heathen worldview of things, the sense of obligation, the idea of obligation, this whole thing that we have, um, obligation is, is, is tied to, to, to tribe and to tied to frith as from like the olden days, like from, from ancient heathen perspectives of things. Like for me personally, like my tribe and everything, like I practice heathenry in a way that is is very tribal, and so I am I am, you know, tied through frith and, and and through obligation to my tribe, and so even though that's not the same thing, at the at the root level, there is some aspects of that on social media and on platforms like this because, hey, people look at us. And like, you've done your due research, like, you know, your shit. And if we don't know our shit, who's that fall on, right? Who's that fall back on? It, fall back, it falls back on us. And so like, we're, we're obligated in a way to make those corrections. And that's another thing too, uh, Bob, like I've received public criticism. I'm sure you have as well. Um, over the years and over time. I got death threats, man. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I don't think that they were ever really real, but you know, you teach that Yule was on a full moon after the solstice, people are going to be ready to lynch you. They don't want to look but at But why? Animals. Like, but why? And but why is that? I guess, I, I guess that's a loaded question. Like, why is that sort of thing launched? And then how do, do, do you respond to things like that? Do you like, well, you know what? Tough nuts, you're wrong and I'm right. Or do we, I don't know, like what's your, what's your approach to things like that? Well, I've seen different, every religion to a point has had some differences, but let me use this as example because it's the best one I can think of. The Protestants had a split with the Catholics, right? It was really about the sale of indul indulgences, prayer to Mary and saints. You know, Luther may have made 90, five point or 95 theses or whatever but the you know for people to hear that because you know the church kept the latin so they only kept the scriptures in latin and they read it and not everyone knew latin and they weren't learned so they couldn't read so to have commoners hear that prayer to mary isn't scriptural in the new testament that did ruffle feathers it really did um you know, um, there are there are some sects in Christianity today. They believe that Jesus was in the ground three days and three nights. So the Friday crucifixion 
Sunday morning resurrection wasn't right. And they'll have militant fights online debating about this. Um, now people say, well, you're talking monotheism, but the point that I'm trying to make is, I guess the best word might be sacred cow. You know, um, people have celebrated the solstices in neo-paganism for so long to hear that Germanic heathens did it different and to prove it using the historical sources in the sagas. Because, I mean, the sagas even flat out state that it's not the solstice. <laughs> they flat out state it. Um, and there was persecution over it because December 25th was the Gregorian solstice and they were trying to get the heathens to move Yule to the solstice. It's right in Hawk and the Good. Yeah, it's the Hawk and the Good saga. saga. Yeah, like it was, it was that whole Christianization approach to try to 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 maintain a celebration a, a heathen celebration through the the christianization of the area in, in in norway so i'm using this example though to answer your question because um you know it's people don't know the sagas they don't know the eddas they say they do like so few christians read the bible how many heathens have actually read the eddas once cover to cover plus cracked open some sagas and there's several hundred sagas there, <laughs> okay. there, there's literally hundreds of, of sagas that you know poems and charms and yeah christians talking about heathens muslims talking about heathens i mean there's a lot of sources out there so people just assume and you know like the the loki thing um you know dr jackson crawford isn't my favorite person but he teaches a lot of things that are correct. And one of the things he taught in one of his videos is there's over a thousand place names for Odin and uh, Thor. Thor and Freyr even. I mean, maybe yeah, not hundreds, yeah. but, but, but Odin, Thor and Freyr are some big names that we see in Scandinavia and Germanic areas. And how many are there for Loki? Yeah. Zero. So, yeah, right. Um, so and you actually have been a big advocate for um, what's his name, Scott? Um, Scott T. Shell. He's got a Ph.D. in Germanic linguistics and he's an old Saxon heathen. So, you know, I'd say he's even more knowledgeable than me. And, and I'll say go to him first and foremost, even ahead of me. I know it doesn't help my blogs, but, you know, but, I think but when it comes to when great. it comes to knowledge and when it comes to learning about things like when you talk about a scholar looking at things from a academic standpoint, that's one thing. When you compound a scholarly approach to, with someone who is an actual heathen, which Jackson Crawford, all due respects to the Dr. Crawford um, here Christian as well. Church. A, you know, like he's not a heathen, but like Scott is. He 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 has the PhD and he practices Germanic heathenry. So in, in my mind, it's like, hey, if if you want to expound and, and, and add to the the academic aspects of things, like why not learn that? So for, for those that are listening, watching, like the show notes, the description, um, Scott's channel is going to be annotated and included in all that because I follow all of his stuff and I find it um, very informational. Like I, I love. And if Scott's I can throw content. one more thing out, when I've gone to Germany with my sons to visit my family, I've met a Saxon heathen in Germany who's a professional heathen archaeologist. He's literally a heathen and he's an archaeologist. And I've supported him, given him money. He's given my family tours of Saxon heathen holy sites. Like I had no idea that there was a, a Saxon well to Thor. And the Christians wow. built a well on top of it and renamed it Peter's Well. And hmm. there's even literary evidence, plus the archaeological evidence, to have a Saxon heathen who's a, he's finishing his PhD now, and he's done hundreds of digs as his full-time job, um, to have that sort of tour going through museums and, and holy sites. Um, let me give you his blog as well. Um, his last name, I'm not giving you his real last name because he doesn't want his real last name out. Yeah, if you don't mind, just uh, uh, yeah, Bob, you got, yeah, just just shoot me the link and I'll, I'll make sure that it's annotated in the, uh, the show notes if that's okay. 
Yeah, he's got a German and English blog because, you know, a lot of those Europeans are bilingual or trilingual. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, multilingual. (laughs) (laughs) That's an interesting thing, too, that the fact that Thor's well was was changed into Peter's well. And I've, you know, on the surface, being, like I said, raised in in Christianity my whole life, it's like the uh, the uh, the impact or the uh, the power that, quote unquote, St. Peter. Okay had um in the gospels um and the impact or the power that thor donar dunar whoever you want to name him as as being the people's god the 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 kind of the the go-to guy okay um is there we don't know maybe perhaps we do but is there a correlation between such a strong figure in the lore between such a one in the Germanic approach to the, to the, to the church's um, influence or the church's idea of like, Oh, well, it's Thor. He's the people's guy. Oh, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just rename him as St. Peter or something like that. I don't know. Well, Christianity was destructive though. A lot of people think that the heathenry survived in the church, but it's really the opposite. I mean, they killed witches in their witch hunts. They tried to stamp it out. Some like Dunar's well, though, the Christian fort that rose in its place. Because if you saw it, you'd be like, man, I can understand why the heathens had a hill fort there and why the Franks then built a castle there. I mean, that was the only way to get water from that well. So, you know, you can just get <laughs> Can't rid of Can't live the without it. Farm. Yeah. <laughs> but you can burn down a sacred grove. And what Charlemagne did is he built a church in the sacred grove. So it ruins nature, which was the true sanctuary. And then you put Christian graveyard there where they're not burning the dead. And I'm not saying that every heathen did inhumation. There were some that did not. Um, the Danes and the Swedes tend to burn more. The Saxons mm-hmm. did both. They ha- If they buried, it was a north-south orientation of the grave that was peculiar to just the Saxon tribe, by the way. Learn that from the archaeologists and from the museums. Um, you know, there, there were differences, but for the most part, um, Christianity was trying to conquer heathenry and wipe it out. Um, it it kind of like Arminius didn't compromise with the Romans, he killed them. The church was n- in no mood to compromise. And when you're the winning army, why do you have to compromise? Everyone thinks, yeah. well, you have to, to get the people in line, but that's not really true. You know, you can, if you tell a lie long enough, it's going to become the truth. You push it long enough, it's going to become the truth. And today we live in a very Christian world even though only 22% of America attends a religious service semi-weekly now. We're the, the, the most secular we've ever been in America right now, but the Christian mindset is still there. We still have a seven day week and, and a belief that there is a God that created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. We still have a Roman Catholic system of telling time. Um, yeah. You know, well, it's interesting. It's forever changed. It has been, um, but it's interesting with um, at least, you know, I don't know how everybody else that's listening or watching or even you, Bob, um, I, I see more heathen content um, on my social media st- uh, platforms that are focused on um, the old ways. And I'm talking like pre-Christian times, like the prior to the Viking age, digging up things that uh, existed prior to that conversion period and i've even had engagements with you know people in my professional life in their religious beliefs that are not pagan um, that still observe their own um specifically islam you know what i mean like they have a very structured um calendar and, and things of the way that they believe things and i applaud them for that and i applaud anyone that's listening and watching um that uh, maintains and adheres to a, uh, a very structured and a historical approach to their uh, religious views. Because um, the more I've grown as a heathen and the more that I've developed as a heathen, I think that there's a lot of value placed in the, um, the roots of things. And I've been one to uh, sort of say that, you know, um, a tree grows from its roots and has to have strong roots and the branches that grow out from that are going to be the future for days to come but you have to have those strong roots and you have to know what those roots are and you have to be well rooted and well 
you know, versed or well, you know, knowledge. So I don't, I don't necessarily say that, Hey, everybody should become, you know, reconstructionist <laughs> in their, in their approach or things like, Hey, it, it, to me, it's like, it's, it's, um, and, and I, and I've mentioned Eric Ward Weaver Shervin, uh, of the Ravens call. It's like, it's your hall and your call you do you. And that's ultimately where it lies. It's your hall, your call. If, if you don't have a strong hearth cult established, then that to me is where heathen relies is in the hearth and in the home. And if you don't have a strong root system built there, then, then where do you have the go from? Because you're, 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 you're pulling from historical sources that are in, in neighboring countries or foreign countries that you don't even live in. So for a lot of our North American listeners and, and viewers, right, it's you're here now. And the, the, the thing and the time that worked in these Germanic countries and in these Germanic areas, whether it be the mainland Germania or in Scandinavian neighboring countries, right, there's a lot to pull from. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of good things to pull from from there, but also establish your tribal culture, establish your hearth cults here now where you are. So, you know, if you're listening in New Mexico, if you're listening in Washington state, or if you're listening in the Adirondacks, you're listening down in the Ozarks or wherever the hell, right? Hey, if you don't so, mind, I'm going to jump on that. Um, yeah. One thing I learned in Judaism, this is going to sound like I'm attacking my own people, but trust me, I'm not because I'm very proud that I have a Germanic heritage. But the Jews are the only nation of people that I know of. They all got exiled from their homeland after genocide was committed on them by the Roman army. They were sold throughout the Roman empire as slaves um, and they kept their ancestral religion um, as the tribe of Judah for centuries. And they survived centuries upon centuries upon centuries of persecution. And they did not give up their old ancestral customs. A lot of people may say, well, the Old Testament gave birth, the New Testament gave birth to Christianity. You can say that all you want. But reality is, is there are still Jews today who are keeping their ancestral traditions. And what's really sad is that when the persecution came from the Christian armies, you know, our ancestors did not have that same resilience, whether we like to admit it or not. Heathenry is a reconstructionist faith to a point. We're taking gods that stopped being worshipped and we're coming back to these old ways. Um, it's never a good thing to lose a culture. I mean, Rome's drive for empire, a Reich, um, it was a culture killer. And religion and culture go hand, hand in hand. I mean, the pyramids have religion in them. You know, it was a religious culture, just as our Germanic culture was driven by its religion, religion and culture. You can't separate them for the most part, historically. Um, when our ancestors gave up their religion, you know, a church in Scandinavia didn't look all that different from one in Rome, and the Latin mass in Scandinavia didn't sound any different from the Latin mass in Rome. So, you know, it did kill our culture, and we should be prideful, and it's not a racist thing. I'm proud of where I came from, and every person, no matter what color of skin they are, needs to be proud of where they came from, or they should be. So, so let me just let me just pause for a second. When it comes to pride, when when you, when you say like the you know the color of skin, like I don't feel that there's any pride in the color of one's skin. There's nothing to be prideful about as far as first of all, there is no such thing as the white race. Okay, and I've I, I I've been an advocate of 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 that since since day one. Like your cultural pride, like the the things that you have. First of all, but like, you know, Bob, your 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 ancestral heritage and 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 the the amount of ties that you have to your Germanic family, that's your thing. My uh, familial ties to my, um, you know, ancestral heritage extends to beyond German uh, ties. Like I, I have Mediterranean ties. I have all kinds of, like we're mutts. We're Americans and we're mutts. And so as as as, as being as such. Let's just, I mean, I just want to go on the record as saying like, there's no pride in your skin color. There's no such thing as the white race. Um, and that is, that is, that is a big, that is a big topic of discussion. I don't mean to interrupt you and in what you were trying to say, Bob, but no, I'm glad you, you did want to say, we're all against racism. 
So you're right. Some people probably, if you didn't do what you just did, some people would have came away. Even though I mentioned before that racism is bad and, you know, there's so much misinterpreting going on out there too. I mean, especially now in the, in, in this, in this, in this crowd, like in this, um, you know, umbrella term of, of, of paganism, the you know, cultural appropriation is a hot, and I mean hot, I'm talking about like strike the iron when it's hot, like topic of discussion, you know what I mean? Um, there's a lot of discussion going on around this sort of thing. And I just want to say um, on this platform, like there, there, there's no place for um, sympathy towards anything that uh, points to any uh, belief or, or, or recognition of, of uh, supremacy or adoration towards a quote unquote right, white race, because there is no such thing. Well, I absolutely agree. I would say too, though, heathens understood historically that like they had a word al sadu in Saxony for the old ways of the people, but then there were land wissa, which meant customs of other lands. Um, I think our heathen ancestors, they never tried to force their ways on others. They understood that their customs were their customs and they understood that other cultures were beautiful too. Uh, the world is a better place multicultural. Yeah. And, you know, when there is a monotheistic religion that comes in and forces everybody into it, the, the cultures start to, to not be as distinct because everyone's becoming Christian. And the world is a great place when it is multicultural. And, you know, when I go to Egypt, I want to feel like I'm in Egypt. When I go to Germany, I want to feel like I'm in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I see plenty of McDonald's and even KFC, for goodness sakes, in Germany. And, <laughs> you know, they have they have so like their menus, their menu items are are like regionally and culturally based. Like you can't get certain things in a McDonald's in the U.S. Uh, that you can only get in other countries. And so they adopt their 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 cultural um uh, like the, the 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 cultural diversity, right? When it comes to foods and that and that sort of thing, like it's 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 all there. Um, it's hard. To and find I know out. I know Bob that like you've you you you've come under attack, and and I just want to just like put it out there, like you've come under attack at, at some point in time as as being someone that doesn't you know make any sort of claims against uh, you know whether it be Declaration One Twenty Seven or any of these sort of things, and. I just gotta say, you know, these 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 various declarations are like racism is a bad thing that exists in the world, and we see it so much uh, in heathenry, in in various, um, especially Germanic heathenry, because we we have this infiltration of um, white supremacy and then white nationalism and all these kinds of nasty things that that just have no place in the the true authentic. Um, beliefs of 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 what heathenry is. Um, so, for 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 anybody listening or watching right now, and and I hate to just like put it out here, you know, man, like we're on we're on the air and we're and, and we're saying these things. It's it's you know there there there's no place for racism in heathenry. You know, and that's one of the reasons why Al Sadu tries to distance itself from the name Asatru. And, and it's kind of unfair because not everyone in Asatru is racist. That's that's what they're trying to say with Declaration 127. Um, why don't I sign Declaration 127 when I think it's right? Um, I've been asked that. And my answer is, is there are people who have signed the declaration who have given me death threats. You know, there are people who have signed that declaration who have put me on a list of racist, true racist, actual racist, um, and have, in a sense, made my family unsafe due to that. Um, and also, you know, I don't want to say we're superior to us, Drew, because I do think that there are, just as there's like an Orthodox Christianity and a more reformed and a, a more liberal um, we're going to have distinctions within heathenry. And I think most reconstructionists who really take it intellectually, most of them understand that historically heathenry wasn't racist and racism seems to not, I'm not saying it can't affect a recon because hate can go anywhere, but, but I do really, um, 
think that that's one reason why we have to separate because if I were to Google the word osteotry right now, you're going to see many websites coming up talking about the uni folky debate. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we, all, we almost need a reboot, you know. Um, a hard reboot, <laughs> a hard reboot. And I think that with things that um, some of us are out here doing um, to, to try and educate the public, um, in a holistic way, right? Um, because I'm inclusive. I'm all inclusive. It doesn't matter to me what your skin color is, what your genealogy is, what your, what your ancestry is, um, what you're inclined to want to believe, right? And what you're inclined to want to follow in your religious approach is largely and no, it's not even largely, it's 100% it's due to whatever the hell you feel, okay? Because let's face it, I've got enough Mediterranean ancestry tied to me that if I wanted to try and, you know, blame the fact that I'm a, a you know, Germanic heathen or whatever, well, I'm focused on my ancestry. Well, I could be also equally as focused on my Mediterranean ancestry, and I could be following the Roman pagan gods if I so choose. But I am inclined to follow a Germanic approach to things and it has has you know very little if anything to do with my ancestry and it, it it's not about a superiority complex it's not about uh, cultural pro appropriation it's about understanding and, and knowing the the and respecting the regional cultures of these lands and of these regions and 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 I think per, uh, preserving the integrity of that culture without appropriating that culture. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, you know, I think I know that we're, we might be running low on time, but I got a little bit more time. Um, sure. You know, um, we went into the weeds a bit and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it, this is all good. Um, and it's good that we cleared things up. Um, so you, you definitely have the wisdom with, you know, as a writer, I've done less YouTubes than I have blogs. You definitely are more experienced at the, the YouTube blog and podcast than me. But, um, you know, there, the reconstructionist model that al Sadu uses is we reconstruct the, the timing of the holy days, the meaning of the holy days, and rituals. Um, obviously, Germanic peoples had slaves, and had heathenry survived till today, that would... The Scandinavian people rejected slavery before many other nations did. Um, so, you know, we don't do human sacrifice. And I, I know what the historical sources say on human sacrifice. Um, it's not as bad, so to speak, not that human sacrifice is ever good. But, you know, we can do a podcast on that sometime. I have several sure. blogs up on it. Um, you know, um, you know I, I have a lot to say on it, but, you know, the old ways approach is keeping the customs of the holy days and, and how to do the those holy days. What is Yule a celebration of? What is Winter Nights a celebration of? What's Sigurdlot a celebration of? Mm. And how were the bloats and symbols done at that period of time? Mm. Um, and then we apply that to today. We do not, you know, I've been accused of being a recon, so therefore I must do human sacrifice. I mean, obviously, if I did a human sacrifice, odds are I'd be in jail. Um, <laughs> Come on. So, <laughs> yeah. Come on. Like, that, that, this is one of the things, like, I, mean, I don't know if we talked about it offline or before, but it's like, this is just not one of the things that fits into the modern day construction. Like, look, guys, we are modern heathens practicing the old ways in modern times. We're talking about learning about things that existed 1,500 or more years ago. It was a way different. I mean, look at the fact that the, the society in North America at the time was different 100 years ago versus 1,500 years ago when, when North America wasn't even a, you know, a, a cum stain on the sheet, as it were. OK, <laughs> so let's 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 table that sort of thing for the next uh, podcast discussion, but you know, for everybody that's 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 joined in and listened and watched, you know, this has been a long, I think, beneficial, um, you know, open discussion about things. And I appreciate you, Bob, for uh, taking the time out of your evening for you know making your uh, 
your voice known and everything like that. So um, everybody that's, you know, listening, watching, there's going to be information in the show notes. There's going to be information in the description because this is going to be premiered on YouTube. Um, well, it's premiered on YouTube right now because you're listening and watching. So check out the description for all my channel members. You know what to do. Um, <laughs> Head, head down into the description, check it out for all the podcast listeners, check the show notes. Um, a big thank you and applause to, uh, to Bob Sass sauce uh, for, uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule for uh, coming out here. And uh, if you don't mind, sir, just uh, stick with me before we end the podcast so we can tie things off. Um, but yeah, for everybody that's uh, participated in today's premiere and is listening, um, you are all appreciated and uh we, we we thank you for your constant support so be sure to you know do the whole thing with uh mm -hmm. subscribing following sharing commenting the whole bit you know the social media song and dance as it were so big thanks hey, to my guest for having me thank you for having me by the way yeah loved and it we had a great time so thank you robert sass sauce uh, for attending today's Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Stick around for more to come, hopefully, uh, from my honored guest. Hail and thank you all, and we'll see you in the next podcast. <laughs>